My name is Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. I grew up in the state of Mississippi, a town called Gulfport. Um, grew up in a single parent home, uh, mother having a, the equivalent of an eighth grade formal education. Uh, never knew my father. I had two brothers, one older, three years older, by the name of David, younger brother by the name of Umar, seven years younger. Whips Yala to Ellis. Mahmoud again. Up at the top for three. Yes! He's five out of five in this first period of play. Unbelievable. Christianity played uh, was very pivotal. Uh, my mother uh, wasn't necessarily overtly religious, but more so my grandmother, my aunts, my uncles, and we spent a lot of time, whether it was uh, being taught Christianity in homes or going to sanctified churches. Um, and, and a lot of what we were taught primarily dealt with fearing God. And so at an early age, you had, a, had an awareness that you are going to be accountable for what you do. And prayer was big in, in my family. Um, so it definitely molded and shaped uh, my, my view of, to an extent, God and religion and and how important it was. Prayer was very important um, because we're, you know, we're, we're all in need of, of God's guidance. Um, and at an early age, when you're younger, you usually play, pray more for yourself. Please God, give me this, give me that. And we were taught that pray more for others and there's a chance maybe that God will bless you more. And so I began to do that a lot. Um, but prayed all the time, but more importantly also, the importance of not just praying and asking God for something that you're not willing to work toward. And so it was very important to pray, and as you pray, you move towards your prayers, you have a better chance of being answered. Uh, my, my being introduced to Islam, um, it was bits and pieces now that I look back over the years. Uh, even growing up in, in Biloxi, Mississippi, in an apartment complex, seeing a Muslim family and seeing the way that, one of the sisters was dressed, even though it didn't hit me then, the older I became, I'm like, wow, you know, Allah was, was planting a seed through these images, watching Roots and seeing in the movie of Roots, uh, the character Kunta Kinte uh, told me at the time, making Salah, uh, hearing the word Salaamu Alaikum. It didn't resonate then, but more importantly, uh, when I went to LSU, the head coach gave me the autobiography of Malcolm. And that was the pivotal point. That was what, was what really took me over the edge and started making me think about the religion in and of itself. Um, and just the many questions that I had that was difficult or people couldn't answer. And I got tired of hearing the same, oh, well, you just have to believe or you can't question God. And that was unsatisfactory to me. And, uh, and so, yeah, that, that autobiography, really changed my life and the way I would begin to think about Islam. After reading, after reading the autobiography of Malcolm and looking at how his life was transformed, uh, coming from the nation and then going to Hajj and then how he began to have more of a world view, a comprehensive uh, understanding of Islam, um, it, it, was, it was very appealing in that it seemed to have accommodated the uh, made accommodations for just a human being in terms of, it, it had more of a atmosphere of unity associated with Islam, if that makes any sense. Um, but I still didn't know a lot, of course, because I wasn't in the faith. But just the little bit that I had read about how it transformed Malcolm and how he changed from having a segregated view of the human being into a more holistic view. and and whites, blacks, and everybody a part of that same family, that appealed to me. Because at one stage in my life, I got caught up in the, in the dogma of black man is God, this and this and this, because growing up in the South, seeing what, I, seeing what I saw with whites and blacks, it's appealing. You try and attach yourself to something that, you know, that, that makes you, you know, feel important, you know, so on uh, so, but at the same time, when I read that, I'm like, it, it, it appealed to my, uh, what do you call it, my true inner self. I'm like, you know, this is really the way to go. And one thing led to another. Um, 
I ended up, um, I met a brother named Mark James. And because at the time I was still professing to be a Christian. And I would put crosses in my shoes. I would put crosses in my, you know, because this was something that I've been practicing for years. And it's hard to want to let it go, especially if you don't have all of the information what's coming. And uh, make a long story short, we, we became very close. And he mentioned to me, he said, hey, uh, Islam came up in conversation. And I said, you interested? He said, yes, you? I said, yeah. He said, well, I met this brother. He said, we can go to the masjid and get the Quran. And I remember rushing to the masjid with him. And it was a very kind brother that was tending to the garden. He invited us in. We said we were told we can come and pick up the Quran. Picked it up, rushed back home. And I remember just reading two, three pages later. He was sitting across just like you are. And I don't, I don't remember the pages. I don't remember exactly what it was. But all the questions I had growing up, it seems like within those two to three pages, it, they were answered. And I looked at him. I said, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be a Muslim. That's it. And I began to go to the masjid and learn. And that summer after my first year, I embraced Islam. Haven't looked back. I can't say that the, prior to my becoming a Muslim, I can't say uh, that the media had a positive and or negative effect. I wasn't paying attention to, to them as much, so that could be a good thing. <laughs> Before I embraced Islam, the, the only contact that I had with the Muslims was an African-American janitor uh, who I would go to periodically to just question, uh, ask him questions about, about the faith. And he, would, he was my first teacher, so to speak. And uh, it's like everything he told me just made sense to me. And that's when, after my first year in the NBA, that summer came around, uh, I ended up embracing Islam. When I first embraced Islam, uh, I remember calling my mother. And I said, well, Mom, I'm, I've become a Muslim. She said, oh, that's so good, baby. Everybody needs something to believe in. So wonderful, right? Called her back a day or two later, said, well, you know, my mom, I'm a Muslim. Who you been listening to? Yeah, who you, who you, uh, uh, who's influencing you? And I had a talk with her, and I told her, look, this is what I believe in. I love you to death, but you can disown me, you can do whatever. I'm not going to stop believing in this Islam. And she became one of the first, actually, to correct people when they would call me by my old name. She said, oh, his name is Mahmoud. His name is not, you know, Chris anymore. Was my career affected in any way because of my decision to become a Muslim? Initially, when I became a Muslim, there was no issue necessarily. But when I began to practice my faith, showed an interest in really living up to its principles, it disturbed the conscience of, I think, certain individuals. Um, I was approached in my career about, why are you fasting? Uh, they tried to discourage me from that, and I had to, uh, the trainer, and I had to tell him, listen, this is what I believe in. You don't have to, but this is what I'm going to do. And what was interesting is after that, uh, Ramadan passed, and stats went up out the roof, mine as well as Hakeem's. And uh, the next year came around, and they were saying, when is Ramadan? It's another free throw. Mahmoud will shoot the free throw. He's 8 for 11 now from downtown. The Nuggets a season high and threes made as a team of 12 tonight. That's really incredible, Mike. This is, this is a record performance here by Mahmoud tonight. I mean, he is definitely in some kind of zone. I haven't seen him in a zone like this before. But it's a nice give back by Tommy Hammonds. He's pulling up over Malone from deep. Malone didn't even try to block him. Um, but even praying before games, when we would lose, they would, during losses, they would try to make a big deal, try to put pressure on you and put you in the spotlight. We have individuals that's not being here on time, they're down doing, but they were referring to me. So you, you'd get that from time to time. And of course, after the flag incident, uh, was when my career just eventually went downhill in terms of playing. But, but you would get that from time to time. Um, uh, Islam teaches us to stand up for what we believe in, stand up for our principles, and this is what I've been trying to do and continue to this day to try to do. Uh, I began to read more when I became a Muslim, and through my reading, whether it was Noam Chomsky, Gorvidal, Rand, I mean, I'm reading everything I can get my hands on because I felt I was deprived. 
growing up because of my educational background. Uh, and the more I read, I developed a conscience. And that conscience led me to make that decision uh, not to stand. There was an incident uh, after a game and we lost. And one of the, the coaches actually came to me and they made the statement that we have guys doing that X, Y, and Z. And, and uh, I knew they were talking about me. So after one particular game we lost, Michael Evans came to me and he said, uh, I guess he called himself investigating my religion behind my back not wanting to take my word for it. And he said, uh, Mahmoud, he said, well, we, we talked to somebody, someone and, and they said that you didn't necessarily have to pray before the game. You know, you could wait. And I said, Mike, I said, if you want to know anything about my religion, you can come and ask me. I said, true, I don't have to. Uh, I mean, I can wait. But I said, Allah in the Quran tells us that unless your life is threatened, X, Y, and Z, you know, establish your salah. I said, and I looked around, I was being facetious. I said, last time I checked, I don't see bullets flying around or anything, so I'm going to pray when it's time. All of those things. Um, the, after 9-11, the interview that I gave, it was obvious. I had one more year left, and it was obvious when it came down. It was supposed to be more, uh, a little bit about the flag and things of that nature, but because of 9-11, they sent a guy named Bernard Goldberg. Um, and he had it out. I could see it in his face from the door. And the first question he asked me, usually reporters will warm you up. They said, well, how's the family? Da, 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 da. And he sat down and he looked at me. He said, so do you think Bin Laden did it? <laughs> and I kind of giggled. And then I just, I wasn't in the mood to be diplomatic. And I just spoke my conscience. And that's really what killed the deal for me in my career. Uh, when they see that you have that, I guess, that, that passion to stand up for what you believe in. So my upbringing, um, I was always taught from my mother and from my grandmother and people like that that just your humility in and of itself would take you further than being arrogant. And this life is very transient, it's temporary. And we're all gonna leave it. Like one old guy told me, he said, none of us are gonna make it out of here alive. So I'm not in, I, I'm in no position to be arrogant or cocky. And so I'm always trying to be to be humble as much as possible. My introduction to the Ahlul Bayt uh, came from a brother named Hashem Allah-Uddin and Wali. Uh, I was on a road trip in Portland. And when I came into Islam, I didn't know anything about the whole quote unquote differences. Um, been meeting a lot of beautiful people and they happened to have been in the hotel lobby. So I'm like, Ma, because that happened to me a lot when I would travel, which helped me to stay grounded throughout my career. And I would, customarily, I would invite them either to eat or come up to the room. But that night, we, uh, I invited them to the room. We had a game the next day, and we got into just a long conversation. And we immediately connected. They ended up staying the night in my room, overnight. We ordered room service and everything, and a relationship developed. And throughout that relationship, he just began to just speak to me about Islam, not necessarily introducing Ahlul Bayt initially, and uh, what he was saying to me just appealed to me more than maybe most. And uh, eventually he told me, well, this is, you know, where this is coming from. And I said, oh, interesting. And uh, I just gravitated to it. And uh, that's, how, that's how it happened. In, in essence, the whole history, whether you're dealing with infallibility, the imam mate, these things just made a lot of sense to me. Um, looking in the Quran, how we have to send our salutations on the Prophet and his family, all of those things. Um, but nothing right now in particular uh, necessarily stands out. I don't know if I would classify it as the worst hardship I've encountered, but I think the lifestyle of the NBA, if I were to say right now, and growing up in the West and not in an Islamically grounded family, even though I had uh, some uh, uh, Christian background, um, the lifestyle especially as, as, as a young man. And it took me to maybe my high school years. You know, we know what Islam says about dating and things of that nature. And when you're in the NBA, when you come out of that culture of dating and, and doing those things, and then now that, now that you become a Muslim, you definitely have to be more disciplined. And the lifestyle of the NBA is such that people are constantly coming at you all the time, and in particular women. And so those are usually 
you know, those are usually those were the toughest uh, struggles for me, and that's why I was blessed throughout the, my career. To constantly, when I would go from uh, arena to arena, city to city, I would have brothers. They would meet me, and most of my nights in other cities, we would spend in the hotel room just dealing with issues. And when the night is over, it'd be so late. So even if you did want to contemplate, Shaitan was trying to knock, knock at your door, it was too late to do anything. And, and that helped build my discipline throughout the year. So alhamdulillah, I've been reading lately on the importance of knowledge, the importance of information. And I think one of the things that I didn't have when I was coming up is how you can take all of this information that only comes from Allah, obviously, and how you can unify it. You know, so many times we have specializations, you know, in terms of knowledge, and we don't have the, the overall picture. And everywhere in the Quran, I think when you read about those who have attained the faith, or when you're dealing with knowledge, Allah always backs it up with and do the righteous deeds. So when you combine what you learn and, and with the action, like the Prophet Sallallahu is recorded to have said that act upon what you know and Allah will teach you the rest. You have to, if you just sit on that knowledge, because knowledge is a moving force, it's, it's an active force. And uh, I was listening to a brother actually and he was saying that mostly every word in the Arabic language is derived from a verb, verb shows action. So when you take this knowledge, and even though you may not know what the outcome will be, but you know, look, this is what Allah has given me, I believe it, I'm gonna go, doors begin to open. You get stronger, you develop confidence. And I would say definitely learn as much as you can, but as you learn, apply. And you build, you build strength and character like that. And it helps you to become stronger. I believe reading, studying your history is very important. Uh, it gives you a sense of belonging a sense of who you are. Um, and when, you, when we allow others to um, interpret our history for us, we're always susceptible to their interpretations of who we are, what our expectations, our possibilities are. So it's important to, I think, for that reason, uh, or even if it's alone, to, to study history. Um, because it's an encouragement when you learn about the accomplishments of those who came before you. Allah speaks about it in the Quran. You know, there's a, there's a quote that I, I keep in my kitchen in reference to legacies, and it's, um, it's, it's by George Washington Carver. And he said, no one has the right to come into this world and go out of it without leaving behind distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. And I think, you know, Allah has given us this life, and who are we to waste it? And so we all have a responsibility to leave something and hopefully leaving something uh, worth leaving, in a sense. For those who are consider considering reverting, I would say definitely continue to study, to analyze, make sure this is something that you're for sure about, that you're just not jumping into it uh, without thinking, because all through the Quran, Allah tells us to think, to analyze, to ponder, not to be blind, blindly following, because a lot of people, they just jump into anything. Uh, they're the ones that usually ends up falling out quick, quicker. Um, uh, it's a learning process. It's, everything's in stages. Um, be patient with that process. Uh, be sincere about it. And I believe that if you're sincere about your efforts to want to know Allah, then uh, he'll, he'll, he'll uh, increase that awareness and, and, and you'll reach to where you want to be. Uh, and it'll be consistent. Um, but be patient with it. Uh, but for me, it's the no amount of fame, no amount of fortune. This is the best decision that I've ever made in my life. And uh, the most important decision, because I tell people all the time, choosing a faith uh, or how you think about Allah is an issue of life and death. This is nothing to take lightly. So you really want to make sure that this is, you know, you understand this, and, because it's a lifestyle change. And uh, it's a beautiful change, though. So, um,